organizing this uh, symposium. And thanks also to Annalisa for having provided the stimulus uh, in, through her book. Um, a book that uh, seems to me to be ambitious and well wide-ranging um, and engaging with fundamental problems in epistemology. Um, I should say right at the start that I come at these issues from a perspective that's really quite different from that of Annalisa, but it's also a perspective that's different from those with whom she engages. So the, 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 the presuppositions that she shares with her opponents that I would take issue with. I don't want to be to, to plug my own perspective today. That would be inappropriate. But I just warn you that what I say will be colored by that rather different perspective. All I want to do is to, first of all, highlight uh, one point concerning the outlook that Annalisa, Annalisa shares with her opponents. And then I'll raise a couple of issues arising from her account of perceptual justification and extended rationality. The point I want to highlight has to do with a slide that is also easy to make, and I think that Annalisa makes, and several of the speakers here today, and pretty well everybody makes, a slide from um, a common sense thought that we can be justified in believing things because of our perceptions, perceptions being things like seeings, feelings, smellings, and the like. That's the common sense thought. We can be justified in believing things because of our perceptions. To what I regard as a further and much more theory laden thought that our sensory experiences, along perhaps with other factors, can justify our beliefs. The first of the two issues, uh, th that's the point I want to highlight. And then I said I'd raise two issues about Alisa's account of extended rationality. The first is this, whether assuming that there is a problem of what Annalisa calls cognitive locality, the moderate position could adequately address it. And the second issue is whether Annalisa says enough to make sense of the idea that certain background assumptions are constitutive of empirical rationality. I begin with the common sense thought. The idea is that when, for instance, you look at something, say the contents of your fridge, let's philosophers like banal examples, so here we have a banal example. You're looking inside your fridge, and the, the common sense thought is simply this, that when you look uh, in the fridge, you can and normally will thereby be justified in having various beliefs about its contents. You may see that you have some milk there, uh, that there's some butter there, there's some rather old meat, etc., etc. That's the common sense thought. This thought is apt to lead uh, philosophers, epistemologists, and does lead Annalisa, and those with whom she engages, into the further, more theory-laden thought that I think is not part of common sense and indeed is disputable. To build up to this uh, point, I need to attend to the distinction between perception and experience. Remember I said that I'm taking perception to be perceptions to be episodes like, you know, seeing a tree, uh, seeing uh, milk in the fridge, or hearing a fire alarm. That's perception. It's clearly relational, involves standing in a relation to a mind-independent object. Now, it's agreed on all sides that perception so construed is an essentially relational notion. It's widely uh, accepted, though, that perceptions involve what I shall call sensory experiences rather than perceptual experiences. Perceptual experiences, by the way, in my terminology are, funnily enough, experiences implicated in episodes of perception. So if you're having a hallucinatory, a perfectly hallucinatory experience that's uh, for you indistinguishable from a perceptual experience, that's not going to count as a perceptual experience. I use the broader term sensory experiences to include both perceptual experiences, experiences implicated in episodes of perception, but also uh, the kind of experiences you would have uh, in perfect hallucinations. Now, it's widely uh, accepted that perceptions involve sensory experiences. 
Um, it's also very widely accepted, not universally accepted, but widely accepted that those experiences are, as I shall put it, they're not essentially relational to mind-independent objects. They're the sort of experiences that may, as a matter of contingent fact, be caused by uh, a, you know, objects in the world around you, by the impact of these objects upon you through hearing or perception. But that's a contingent matter about the origins of the experiences. The experiences themselves are constitutively or metaphysically independent of uh, mind-independent objects, at least of those mind-independent objects in your immediate surroundings. Now, that <coughs> non-relationist conception, although widely held, has been challenged in recent years by a formidable uh, array of philosophers. I'm you know, just to mention three, uh, John Campbell, Bill Brewer, uh, John McDowell, who uh, agree that, experience, that perceptions implicate experiences, but they think that perceptual experiences, the experiences that are implicated in episodes of perception, are themselves essentially a relation. It's constitutive of the experience that it consists in a relation of awareness of or acquaintance with mind-independent objects. Now, let me just say right at the start, some of the things I shall say might make you think that I'm a relationalist about experience. Uh, I'm, I'm actually not a relationalist about experience, but I do think that whether we perceive things as opposed to merely having experience such that it's just as if we're perceiving things uh, matters to uh, uh, whether we're the issue of whether we're justified in our beliefs. Um, now, the so one issue then clearly is what kind of notion of experience are we working with? Now, I take it that Annalisa's Annalisa's uh, working with a non-relationalist view of experience. She has um, she comments on McDowell's disjunctivism, which implicates a relationalist view and says that she finds it problematic. Um, so I'm going to take it that she accepts the widely accepted view. I just want to draw out some implications of that commitment. One implication is that, in a way, talking of the perceptual basis of our beliefs is just a little bit misleading. Because remember that if you're if you take the sort of standard mainstream line on perceptual justification, I say standard mainstream line, a line broad enough to incorporate the liberal, the conservative, and then leave this moderate position, then you're going to be committed to what I call parity. And I put parity on the handout. And that is the claim that there can be parity with respect to the justification of the belief that an F is before one between a subject who sees an F, recognizing it to be an F, and one for, for whom it merely looks as if an F is there, and who on that account believes that an F is there. So there's going to be, uh, consider a perceptual case and a kind of hallucinatory counterpart of that perceptual case. Here am I looking into in my fridge. It's a case in which I actually see the butter that's in the fridge. I come to believe that there's butter in the fridge accordingly. Uh, let's all agree that I'm going to be justified in believing that in that situation. The point about parity is that someone in a hallucinatory counterpart situation, one in which it's for you merely as if there's butter in the fridge before you, can be exactly on a par with you with respect to justification. Right? That would be true on Annalisa's account, it would be true on the conservative account, it would be true on the liberal account. We just differ in the details of what it takes to have the justification. Now, you may say he's drawing this out as if it's some kind of objection or might be a tension when it's actually a datum that any sensible theory of justified belief has got to accommodate. And I think I used to think that myself. I mean, I used to, 
I, I used to be with these people. I, I, I wrote a book. I wrote a book about it. But then, as, you, as Annalisa says, I, I've spoken in her presence before as a conversion. You know, you, so one has all the zeal of a, a convert. I, I used to take this experientialist view of justification. It seemed that it was. I, I made this slide from perception to experience, and I thought, well, it's just, it's just obvious that when perception gives us justification, it gives us a justification that doesn't, as it were, essentially depend on its being a perception. It, uh, it simply the source of the justification is the experience, and whatever other factors, depending on the details of your position, you take. Now, I, I came to think that this, this simply isn't the right way to think about things. Um, it, it, I mean, one, this isn't quite the order perhaps on the handbook, in, in the handout, but it might be um, easiest to mention it first. I think that Annalisa and others are right. That when you're constructing models of justification in general, and uh, of perceptual justification in particular, we want these models to, as it were, fit. Uh, well, what Annalisa calls practice, I'd rather she didn't use the word practice, but we want it to fit uh, our actual modes of belief formation, our modes of belief evaluation, with respect to whether uh, the subject has knowledge and with respect to whether the person has justification. We want there to be some sort of fit between what we, how we actually go about those things forming beliefs, evaluating beliefs, etc., and the models that we have. And I came to think that uh, despite what uh, the view that I defended earlier, um, experiences conceived in the non-relationalist way. Remember, experiences that are indifferent as to whether they're involved in episodes of perception or episodes of perceptual hallucination. Experiences conceived in that way don't actually figure, at least routinely, in our the considerations that lead us to form beliefs and certainly don't routinely figure in the considerations that we evoke when we're evaluating beliefs, whether they be our own beliefs or those of others. On the contrary, the concepts in terms of which we routinely evaluate beliefs and judge people as having or lacking knowledge are success concepts. They're the concepts of knowledge itself and of perception, when well, that's a success notion, an instance of which we'd be seeing, uh, as opposed to the non-success concepts of belief and of having an ex experience in the non-relational sense. So that was part of what, maybe the, fir the first thing that really moved me Away. Now, of course, you can get around that just by saying, look, you're being too common sense. Who cares about common sense? We're interested in the metaphysics, all that stuff. But still, I'm just telling you, that's what moved me. As to the consideration about parity, it seems to me that, um, think of the case where you're actually looking inside the fridge, right? You see the butter. You believe there is butter before you. Now, in a situation, in any ordinary situation like that, your belief that there is butter before you, notice the existential form of that, right? It doesn't pick out any individual, it's, it just says there is butter present, right? Or butter before me, right? When you have that belief, you're believing it uh, on the basis of, in part because of, a belief concerning this particular butter to the effect that it is butter, right? You've got a demonstrative thought involved here. You're picking out the actual butter. You're believing of that, that it's butter. And it seems to me that in a case where you, you genuinely have recognized that butter as butter, your position is uh, better epistemically than the case, the hallucinatory counterpart case, in which it's merely as if there is butter before you, and you believe accordingly. Now you may say, ah, but we can all do justice to the epistemic difference. One can be a case of knowledge and the other not. 
right? Obviously, in the case where you have hallucination, a perfect hallucination, you can't have knowledge, so we can do justice to the epistemic asymmetry. Yes, you can. But it seems to me that there's an asymmetry at the level of justified belief as well. Your belief that there is matter before you is grounded in a, a, a belief that is constitutive of recognition and knowledge. The knowledge concerning this butter, that it is butter. Now, of course, you may sense a whiff of a kind of knowledge first position here, and it's more than a whiff, it just is that. It, it, un, unashamedly. Um, it's, uh, and, and again, this fits with the, the motivation about um, you know, our actual practice of evaluation. So you, right, okay, so that's party. Now, uh, I think Annelies is committed to parity, but I think we can relate. Uh, I, she's worried, the way I put it in the handout, is that she's worried about parity as it would be worked out by the liberal. And uh, she spells this out in her passage on, uh, on page 25 of her book. Um, I'll just read part of that passage, it's in the handout. She says, it seems that as long as we are merely concerned with perceptual experiences and don't avail ourselves of some externalist story to provide account of why uh, they should at least mostly get in touch with material objects out there, we remain confined within the realm of experience, which as such is not sufficient, warrantedly, to get us outside of it. Now, I, I won't read the rest of the passage. Um, her worry then is that uh, by the lights of the liberal position, there could be two subjects that are on a par with respect to the justification of the belief that a red cube is before them. Right? But such subjects who are, you know, who satisfy the requirements of the um, liberal position. Sorry, I'm, I'm, let me just take a few steps back. Think of two subjects apart in this respect. They both satisfy the requirements of the liberal position, right? So they both have uh, believe that there's a red cube in front of them. They both have the, uh, an appropriate range of visual experience. And it's true of both of them that there are no, no defeaters. Right? It's an undefeated belief. By the liberal position, these people are on a par with respect to justification, even if one of them uh, sees a red cube, recognizes it to be a red cube, and the other doesn't. Uh, Annalisa's worry is they need not be in a power, truly be in a power with respect to justified belief, just because of the problem of cognitive uh, locality. Uh, and why are they not in a power? Because it could be that uh, taking one of the pair it could be that only one of the subjects in the pair has a reason to hold that his or her experiences are at least mostly caused by causal interaction with physical objects. Right? So that, that, that would be an, an asymmetry. Right? So that's the way parity would be worked out for the, uh, for the, uh, for the liberal position and Annalisa is, uh, is uh, balking at it. Now I'm going to come back and um, to, to ask if she's uh, whether her moderate position gets around the problem of locality. Now, I'll, I'll raise a question as to what she does. Um, so I think, well, that's what I'll move on to right now. That's what I'll move on to right now. So we're now on section two, on overcoming uh, cognitive locality. Now, we're familiar, we've had the moderate account before us all day long, uh, not rehearse that. Um, in the second section, what I, what I do is um, raise a question about what is it that determines which background assumptions are relevant right, to perceptual justification. And um, I make the suggestion, this is on page three of the handout, I make the suggestion that the idea seems to be that the assumptions that are integral to 
experiential justification, I'm calling it experiential justification now rather than perceptual because of the considerations earlier, the assumptions that are integral to experiential justification are such that A, only if they were true would our experiences be reliable indicators of states of the external world, and B, only if they form part of an implicit or tacit background picture of the world that is presupposed by our modes of belief formation can our experiences serve their warranting function? So the way I'm presenting it is that claim A, the, the claim that says that only if these background assumptions were true would our experiences be reliable indicators of the state of the external world, that as it were determines um, what assumptions are relevant in the case. And what B says is and they've got to be, those assumptions have got to be part of the background picture. Right. Now, the issue uh, I want to raise is just a very straightforward one. Is it, why is the problem of cognitive locality not just as much a problem for the moderate position as it is for the liberal position and indeed the conservative position? And I want to ex just expand on that by you know, filling out what lies behind the question. How can it be the presuppositions that for all we know are false can, along with the satisfaction of the other requirements of the moderate position, put one in a position in which we have a reason to believe that a red cube is the full one that would not be available to someone who merely satisfied the requirements of the liberal position? So. I'm focusing here on the worry. The worry about cognitive locality is expressed as a worry about having reason to believe something. Right? And I, what I'm asking is, how can presuppositions that for all we you know are false have a reason, uh, give you a reason, or constitute a reason um, to believe something that will, that will put the moderate person in a better uh, position with respect to justification than someone who merely satisfied the requirements of the liberal position. Now again, um, just as with the parity claim, you know, I, I hear my drawing attention to parity and saying that's something you want to at least think about because the consequence of it is that um, it's not actually essential to the justification that perception de facto provides, that the justification is provided by perception. And then people come back and say, yeah, give me a worry. You know, am I worried? <laughs> uh, I just want to put it on the table as something that seems to me that we ought to think about. It could be that there are justificatory asymmetries we're just not thinking enough about. Well, similarly with this case, I can imagine someone saying, look, you, you're talking as if there's some problem about the idea that a reason uh, to believe something, or a, a proposition that is contributory to a reason to believe something, could be something that, for all we know, isn't the truth. And then, again, you might say, well, give me the worry, because don't most of us <laughs> actually accept that there are lots of uh, reasons that we have uh, that are not constituted by truth? Well, in a sense, that's right. There's a way of reading that that's right. I mean, clearly, the we need to distinguish between uh, normative reasons and uh, motivating or explanatory reasons. There can be, there's reasons that are, you know, reasons to believe something, and the reasons that are reasons to do something. And then there are also agent's reasons, there are believer's reasons. There's so-and-so's reason for believing that P. So-and-so's reason for phi, right? And of course, so-and-so's reasoning for phi could be a very bad reason for phi, not a normative reason at all. And so-and-so's reason for believing that P may be a very bad reason for believing that P, not a normative reason at all. Now, I don't want to say that motivating reasons are just completely cut off from normativity. That we need to tell a story about uh, the connection between the two, and I, we can go into that if need be. But look, in a, there's clearly a sense of reason in which a person's reasons need not be constituted by truths. I just happen to think that normative reasons are constituted by truths, and indeed truths that we know. Right? Now, Ungood thought this, and it led him to be a skeptic, and 
you, you, you alluded to Unger's position, actually you attributed to Plato, which you probably came up with first, the, the position that uh, you know, knowledge, <laughs> knowledge, <laughs> knowledge uh, gives you justification. Well, that's something that's been uh, revived by uh, Williamson in recent times, uh, but not with this, any kind of spe uh, skeptical intent. And it seems to me that if we're attending to our actual evaluative practices, it better makes sense of those practices than any other view. Uh, so, but now, Annalisa can clearly, that's not going to be any kind of knockdown for Annalisa. It just, what it does is highlight there are issues about justification. Um, one of the things that um, makes this whole area um, problematic is that the prevailing concept of justified belief is the concept that's figured prominently in discussion of Gettier cases. Now, um, you know, in the standard examples of Gettier cases, there are cases of belief based on prior assumptions, and it's assumed that you can be justified in believing that P on the basis of assumptions, some of which are false. And uh, it seems to me that in a very central sense of uh, justified, where being justified means having a sound basis for one's beliefs, having well-founded beliefs, that is simply not true. I know there are difficulties about getting knowledge out of falsehood. Please don't throw these at me today. Uh, get emotional. Um, so it, there's a perfectly ordinary sense of justified belief on which you will a justified belief is a belief that has a sound basis, and uh, you a false assumption doesn't give you a sound basis for belief. Now, I actually think that's the central concept of justified belief. And what the, is going on in the Gettier cases is a weaker notion. I mean, I'm not going to quibble about words. It's not that these people who had the responses to the Gettier cases were completely off their head, not at all. There's some sense in which you can have a reasonable, you have a reasonable belief in the Gettier situation. But that's that notion I take to be parasitic on the notion of well-founded. It's as it were, I mean, uh, very, very roughly, this won't quite do, but it's as it were internally, just as if it was a well-founded belief. It's just not. Um, right. <coughs> now, I don't want to strain your patience at this late hour, so I'll um, proceed straight to the third section. This, is, uh, this has to do with um, the idea that the background assumptions are constitutive of uh, empirical rationality. Um, I'll, just, I'll just quickly read what Annalisa says about that. Uh, this is 109 to 10 in the book. She says, I take it that the notion of empirical rationality, skeptics and non-skeptics alike share, like many other notions, does not hang in the air, but depends on our practices. In particular, the notion of epistemic rationality depends on the basic practice of producing, assessing, and withdrawing ordinary empirical beliefs, such as, here's a hand, this one is red, etc. Interpreted as being about mind independent objects based on the deliverances of the senses. Now, if that practice rests on assuming with no warrants that there's an external world, that our sense organs are mostly working reliably, and that one is not a victim of a lucid and sustained dream, or otherwise disconnected from causal interaction with physical objects, then those assumptions are constitutive of empirical rationality. It's obviously, well, it certainly seems to me right that an account of rationality or justified belief should mesh well with our actual modes of belief formation. That's how I'd uh, like to put it. And with our modes of evaluating beliefs. That's a point I've mentioned before. It's something about which I agree with Annalisa. But there's a question that arises as to how you characterize those practices. And if I were to be defending the in the knowledge first position and giving weight to the, the notion of well-foundedness, it would be, at least in part, in terms of claims about uh, evaluative modes of evaluation, modes of belief formation. Um, it struck me in thinking about Annalisa's 
position that um, it's in some ways reminiscent of P.F. Strossen's um, historically well-known uh, position on induction. Um, I, in the handout, I give a quote from Strassen. This is Strassen. We're talking about 1952 here. Long, long time ago. Here's the quote from Strassen's logical theory. Consider the uses of the phrases good grounds, justification, reasonable, etc. Often we say such things as, he has every justification for believing it, P. I have very good reasons for believing it. Believing it. There are good grounds for the view that Q. There is good evidence that R. We often talk in such ways as these, of justification, good grounds, or reasons, or evidence for certain beliefs. Suppose such a belief were one expressible in the form, every case of F is a case of G. And suppose someone were asked what he meant by saying that he had good grounds or reasons for holding it. I think it would be felt satisfactory if he replied, well, in all my wide and varied experience, I've come across innumerable cases of F and never a case of F which wasn't the case of G. In claiming this, he's clearly claiming to have inductive support, inductive evidence of a certain kind for his belief, and he's also giving a perfectly proper answer to the question what he meant by saying that he has ample justification, good grounds, good reasons for his belief. It is an analytic proposition that it's reasonable to have a degree of belief and a statement which is proportional to the strength of the evidence in its favor. Now, uh, Annalisa doesn't use the term analytic. She talks of what's constitutive of, which she says, rational belief, but let's, one equally could describe it as reasonable belief. Uh, and I take it that it's in, entailed by what Strawson says when he makes his claim about analyticity that it's constitutive of reasonable inductive belief that is belief based on the kind of grounds that he describes in that passage. To that extent, there's a degree of similarity with analytical position. Strawson's view has generally been regarded as not a very satisfactory view uh, of induction or one that would uh, serve to give one uh, a satisfying account of why induction is reasonable or rational. The problem for the view, or perhaps I should say a problem for the view, as it applies to the inductive justification of a belief that every case of F is a case of G, held on the basis he describes, is that by his own account, the belief will be justified only if there being a suitable number of observed Fs that are cases of G, and no observed cases of F that are not cases of G is indeed evidence that every case of F is a case of G. Now, so th there's a link in Strauss's thinking between having a justification for the belief, an inductive justification for the belief, and having considerations that constitute evidence for the generalization in question. Now, that uh, requirement of evidence, I take to be, in effect, a metaphysical claim. It will be satisfied only if the world is a certain way. And in particular, only if it is such that not easily would it be that there's a suitable number of F case, observed cases of F that are G, and all, and, uh, sorry, and no observed cases of F that are not cases of G, and yet it be false that every case of F is a case of G. That's a metaphysical claim. It's a modal claim that seems to me to be a metaphysical one. Now, uh, of course, it, it might be that Strawson isn't thinking of evidence in that metaphysical way, and it may be that lots of people here don't think of evidence in that metaphysical way either. But it's our way to think of evidence, and it's a way that merits uh, serious consideration. Uh, now, the question is whether an analogous problem doesn't arrive, arise for Annalisa's account. Remember, how does the problem arise? There's an account about justification. Just suppose it is the case 
it's, a, it's right that we, this is how we proceed. Actually, it's too crude. I mean, Gru and Goodman came afterwards, and so we know that it's not as simple as it by a long way. Uh, but just suppose that he was right in characterizing our, uh, the ways we form inductive beliefs and the way, ways in which we evaluate inductive beliefs. That wouldn't itself guarantee that the evidential relation holds between what by those practices are taken to be evidence and the generalization in question. Whether that evidential relation holds uh, depends on the way the world is. Now, of course, uh, that's something that Strassen himself uh, uh, could challenge and probably would challenge. And indeed, Lawrence uh, Bonjour in his discussion of the problem of induction in the Dancy and Souza companion to epistemology uh, comments that um, it looks as if uh, Strassen isn't thinking of evidence in this met metaphysical way at all. He doesn't put it in quite that way. But that's the effect of what he says. And he's probably right about that as an interpretation. But I think there is at least a notion of evidence here that is metaphysical and that needs to be taken seriously on account of justification. Um, moving on to Annalisa's account, and this is my final remarks. It's the last paragraph of the handout. Suppose that we count a person as being visually experientially justified in believing something, provided that she satisfies the requirements of the moderate position. It clearly does not follow that the beliefs that would count as being justified according to this standard would for the most part be true. Whether they would for the most part be true depends on how the world is. You know, the metaphysical claim. Uh, and that is not settled by reflection on what we count as experientially justified. Now this will be a problem for Annalisa if whether an empirical belief is justified depends on how the world is. Specifically, if it depends on whether the belief was formed or sustained in a manner that, such that beliefs that were formed or sustained in that way would for the most part be true. So you know, if you accept that latter assumption, then there's a problem for Annalisa. All I'm putting on the table is there, 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 there is a conception of justified belief that requires there to be this link between the ways in which we form beliefs and the way the world is. But Annalisa must be working with a much more internalist one, the kind of one that leads to new uh, evil demon problems and the like. But that's an eminently resistible way of thinking about justification. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>